This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of December 9th, 2019. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael on Tuesdays from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, what the fall revenue forecast tells us about this year and more importantly, the future. Second, we explain why we think Senator Shelley Hughes' proposed spending cap is an ineffective placebo. And third, what we should take away from last week's warning from the Permanent Fund Corporation. And now, let's join Michael. And we're going to start things off uh, in our conversation this morning with, uh, with uh, I think, probably the biggest elephant in the room, and that, of course, is the fall revenue forecast. And what does it mean for the state of Alaska, uh, not just about this year, but also for the uh, upcoming, you know, four or five years? Brad Keithley joins us. Good morning, sir. How are you? Michael, I'm doing great this morning. How about you? You know, no no complaints other than, as we said earlier, uh, now I want pie. That's all I can say. It's <laughs> just pie is important. All right, well, let's dig into this, Brad. Uh, I read this and I got a little bit of a chill because I thought, man, this is not gonna, this is ugly stuff here. Uh, but we've got some, we got some bad news here, not just for this year, but for years to come on what's happening. Yeah. So the the newspaper articles thus far on the revenue forecast, the fall revenue forecast, have focused on its implications for this upcoming year, uh, for fiscal year uh, 2021, and and they're bad. Um, uh, the uh, revenue forecast shows that uh, a drop in revenues, and I calculate these numbers uh, using uh, the PFD at 50-50 at, at uh, of the uh, percent of market value draw. Um, so sometimes you don't see these numbers other places, but assuming we went to 50-50 uh, POMV, these, these are the revenue numbers. It's showing for the current fiscal year, uh, FY20, that the revenue drop is from roughly 3.7, 3.8 billion dollars down to 3.6 billion dollars, and it shows for the upcoming fiscal year, the one the legislature will be dealing with when it comes into session um, uh, in January, a revenue drop from 3.8 billion dollars down to 3.5 billion dollars, roughly a 300 million dollar drop for FY uh, uh, 2021. Uh, those are bad. I mean, those those are going to make life extremely difficult. A three hundred million dollar drop, for example, in revenues, uh, fake in, in, in this coming year is going to be extremely difficult. But I I don't think that's the big story. The big story is is what this revenue forecast tells us about the next decade. Okay. Um, and 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 it's telling us that that this problem doesn't go away. Um, in fact, it gets worse. When, when we've had these revenue forecasts in the past, uh, there's there's always been uh, an uptick in oil prices that they that they've put in uh, in the out years. So it shows they have tended to show that the current year is bad, but if we can just get through this year and next year and maybe maybe the year beyond that, uh, we're going to finally get to the promised land and we're going to. Um, uh, survive and 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 we'll work our way out of this. Live to fight another day, so to speak. Right. That's right. This revenue forecast uh, tells us something uh, much different. This revenue forecast uh, uses the futures market, uh, the oil futures market, to predict uh, uh, futures oil prices. And the futures market right now is bleak. Uh, it's telling us that that oil stays in the sixty dollar range. 
um, uh, sort of ad infinitum uh, on into the future, and that's and that's what's reflected in this revenue forecast. So when you when you when you take that into account, this revenue forecast, unlike those in the past, doesn't have this this if we can just get there, we'll be okay aspect to it. It 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 shows a very bleak. Um, uh, 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 perspective uh, uh, going forward. For example, um, pick 2025 for just, just three years, three fiscal years from, from the one we're going to be dealing with, uh, or four fiscal years from the one we're going to be dealing with uh, this coming year. It's showing that instead of, of 3.9 billion uh, in terms of revenue, we're going to have 3.7. 2026, uh, 3.8 billion in revenue instead of four. Uh, billion, which is what the spring forecast showed, and and it just stays depressed um, all the way out. You get even more depressed uh, when you when you overlay those revenue numbers with with the spending numbers uh, that that one one projects out there. We'll get into this deeper in the second segment, but if you just take if you take current spending and then trend that by uh, by inflation, it shows huge uh, uh, deficits. Uh, all the way out the remainder of the decade. Uh, for example, picking 2025 again, it shows that current spending levels, FY20 spending levels just escalated by inflation. It shows by 2025, we're at $4.8 billion in spending, but the revenue we have, and this is again is at 50-50 is at um, POMV for the PFD, the revenue uh, by 2025 against that $4.8 billion in spending is $3.7 billion, a deficit of one point. Uh, one billion. So I, the big story here is not is not so much. I mean, it, it's important to focus on what's happening the current fiscal year and the next fiscal year and what the revenue forecast is telling us about those. But the big story here is is we've gotten real about about oil prices going forward. We've gotten real about production levels going forward, and it's showing that this is a problem that uh, that continues uh, throughout the next decade. Uh, if not into the decade following, and I think I think that realization forces a a much different perspective on the legislature uh, and on the governor than uh, than than what we've had up to this point. Where you know they've they've had revenue forecasts that have shown if we could just get there, we'll be okay. Well, and I think that is this this is going to be the wake up call for those that are willing. To, and I guess that's the important part for those that are willing to see it. Uh, that this is going to be the wake-up call that, you know, look, the, the gravy train is over, folks. I mean, we're just not talking about, now we're just not talking about amorphous ideas. We're talking about the the, the spending, the, the revenues are just not going to be there unless you want to find some other, uh, some other uh, part of this. And you're going to get into a little bit later uh, in our discussion, you're going to get into the, you know, the alternative uh, options uh, that are available on the table, like the earnings reserve and other things. But I mean, the bottom line is, is that we're out of money. I mean, there's just no more blood in the stone. And so it's it hopefully going to cause us to take a hard look at what we're spending right now. Yeah, we've just hit the wall. I mean, when Governor Dunleavy, I had this discussion yesterday with somebody, when Governor Dunleavy ran in um, in, in, it seems like a long time ago, but it was just, uh, uh, last year, 2018, when, when governor run, uh, Dunleavy was running in 2018, his, his message in the fall and his discussion in the fall was predicated upon $80 oil, uh, that we were going to get back to $80 oil. And we had the prospect of, of all these, uh, uh, significant developments out toward the end of the decade. Um, and, and we were going to be okay uh, with $80 oil and eight, and you know, if we had $80 oil today, uh, we would be, you know, we'd have 800 million more in revenue. We'd, we'd, we wouldn't be in the situation in which we find ourselves. But what this revenue forecast is telling us is we're not going back to $80, $80 oil, uh, anytime soon. If, if in fact ever, um, and, and, th and this is what the, what the outlook looks like. And, and that means, that means for the legislature and it means for the governor that we're not we're not just looking at you know temporary band-aids as we've been doing since 2012 2013 we're not looking at temporary band-aids we're looking at a, at a structural a long-term structural problem uh, that has to be addressed there will be I mean I, the, the takeaway from this is there will be taxes and the question is who's the who are the taxes going to be on who's going to pay uh, for these deficits, 
but but the takeaway from this is the deficits are huge they're real they're continuing um and 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 you know we we demonstrated last year that cuts only doesn't get 16 votes in the legislature um and so we're facing this uh we're we're, we're going to be facing this huge fundamental problem um uh, over the long term and we need to think now of long-term solutions well, and I think that's the that's the problem. This will hopefully finally make them face the fact because again, there's always been an out, you know, historically. That's that's been part of the problem here in the state of Alaska. There has always been some sort of out, and whether it was uh like you said, the rosy projections from the revenue forecast that said, Well, production's down, but look, oil prices are gonna skyrocket and we'll be saved once more. And historically it has happened. We've seen it happen where things have turned around and we thought we were gonna have a serious deficit and turned out that it either wasn't that bad or we got saved by some kind of spike in oil prices or some kind of Hail Mary that dropped out of the sky. But the bottom line is 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 that's all coming to an end. So hopefully Somebody starts listening to this and, and we start looking at this and seeing that we just can't continue this uh, this level of, of spending. And, and that actually leads me to a quick question, a sidebar, because uh, 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 somebody, Kevin, Kevin in the chat room just dropped me a link. Uh, that's the some of the latest spending. It was this fiscal year 2017 spending from across the entire United States showing Alaska's expenditures on a per capita basis. I mean, we spend more than, you know, uh, anybody else in the United States on a per capita basis. Uh, and in fact, according to uh, th- these numbers, uh, you know, we spend almost twice what they spend in some comparative states like Wyoming and Montana. I mean, we're spending a, a-, a tremendous, a tremendous amount of money uh, across there. The national average is is only about six thousand bucks. We're spending over thirteen thousand dollars for every man, woman, and child. Some people out there are still screaming that. We're just spending too much, and we could still find some cuts in this. And and I agree, we could find some cuts in efficiencies. Is it? Do you think it's going to restart that conversation, or do you think that that conversation is over? I I think we had that conversation last year. I mean the 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 the, the, the conversation last year is we're running out of reserves. We don't have revenues. We've got to get spend. We've got to get spending down. The governor came with a budget, a cuts only budget, his initial budget. Uh, that was sort of dead on a dead on arrival. By the time we got to the end of the of the legislature, and he did his first round of vetoes, he couldn't even get 16 legislators uh, out of 60 to support that first round of vetoes. And we went back, and and we had a second round, and and he, we ended up with a second round of vetoes where we finally came out. But but that spending level where we came out was about 4.3 billion dollars, about a billion dollars more. Uh, uh, than where he started, about uh, thir- about thirty percent more uh, than than where he started. It, it the 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 mood in this state is yes, cut spending, efficiencies, all that sort of stuff, but don't cut my program. And by the time you go through the legislator legislature, sixty legislators, uh, including some uh, a lot uh, of of conservative Republicans. Who all say yes? We need to cut spending, but don't cut my program. Don't cut the program that's important to my constituents. By the by, the time you go through that, um, uh, you 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 the, the cuts don't happen. I mean, the, the the poster child of all this is the university, right? I mean, the university spends last year was spending over two hundred percent more than the national average per full time equivalent student. That that number really wasn't disputed. Uh, by anybody in the uh, anybody in the discussion, it was it was a given. Yes, we spend a lot. We spend more than anybody else in the country per full time equivalent student. We spend over two hundred percent more than two hundred percent of the of the national average. All all right. Okay, so let's cut it. Oh my God, no! Don't cut it. Right. I mean, it's it, it's it's important to Fairbanks. And then. Uh, and, and the governor initially proposed to cut it down to about 100% about about the national average, um, and then the governor, during the course of the course of the session, sort of gave up on that, agreed to half the cuts, and then agreed to to, to, to reducing his cuts in half, and then agreed to, agreed to spending uh, spreading that over three years. I yes, we can. I mean, you and I can go through this budget easily as we have for the past what six years, can go through this budget easily and identify where cuts can be made. But getting the votes, and and indeed even getting 16 to uphold a governor's veto uh, of those cuts just doesn't happen. 
Right. Well, especially when you look at going back to education, the 8% graduation rate, uh, you know, when you're spending 200% of the national average and you're getting an 8%, I mean, that return on investment is so pathetically poor. Uh, you know, you got to start asking questions, and, and I'm sure we're going to get into that as we move forward. Well, that's the number one, of course, is the revenue forecast and what does it spell? And it's not a good look for the state of Alaska. We're, we got some hard times ahead. Uh, as we've been warning about here on the program for the last five years, that this is where we're kind of headed if we don't get ourselves under control. And uh, uh, Brad and I hate to say we told you so, but no, we don't. We told you so. That's uh, what's going on. Pay attention. Uh, since we got into the university topic, this is all very timely and factual. Uh, now we need to talk for just a second about this uh, report from the Board of Regents who last week decided, nah, consolidation, we don't need no stinking consolidation. And uh, that's kind of where we're at right now. Uh, Brad, your thoughts as we uh, as we go forward on that. Oh, this is this is just symptomatic of the problem. I mean, you identify... Uh, you identify uh, cuts that can be made. You identify the efficiencies that can be achieved. You identify uh, uh, pullbacks on, on state services that can be done. Uh, the legislature, just like it did in 2016, the legislature last year directed the Board of Regents to, to consider, because um, they didn't change the statute, they, the, 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 they directed the Board of Regents to consider consolidation uh, as, as a step to try to to try to reduce the cost of, of of the university to try to increase the efficiencies of the university, um, and initially the university uh, uh, seemed uh, trend going in that direction. Uh, the president of the university uh, was focused on that. President Johnson was focused on that. The board seemed to be focused on that. But as time goes on, um, and as as the rear guard action of of those that would be affected by the cuts in this case the the administrations of the of the three separate universities that we have out there uaf uas and uaa um, as they sort of dug in as the faculty of of those uh, uh campuses of those universities dug in um and fought the rear guard action the board uh, uh started started walking backwards um just as they had done in 2016 um, and at the end of the day, they get to this. Uh, they get to the, the 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 meeting last week, and they decide that uh, the re their response to the uh, legislature's uh, direction that they consider consolidation is we we considered it. We ain't going to do it. Uh, we're going to keep our three universities. Now they they put a they put a caveat on that. They said we're going to keep the three universities until we complete the UAF, uh, the Fairbanks uh, reaccreditation in 2021. Um, and then we'll then we'll look at it again. Uh, but this is I mean, this is just what we had in 2016. It's like, yeah, we'll consider it. Oh, my gosh, boy, look at this uproar we're getting. Nah, we don't want to do that. Um, thank you very much for the idea, but we're not going to do it. And, and now we've gone through it again um, in, in 2019, three years later. Uh, and in 2021, it's going to be the same thing. You get to that point. Uh, and and you uh, and, and the and there's going to be this uproar from the constituents involved that benefit from this from this particular segment of spending they'll push back and the board like it has before will cave so i i, I don't think we're going to get i don't think we're going to get there in terms of consolidation unless the legislature not only says consider consolidation but the legislature changes the statute to say we are consolidating by the way guys right you go out you go out and implement it well and i think the one part that you missed mentioning was not only did they say well we'll re-look at the, you know we'll look at this after the accreditation comes back you know but they also said oh we're going to do an in-depth cost benefit analysis as well which again is just more of the same what's the cost benefit analysis that they're going to come back with well all of these constituency groups say that it's not good for us, so we're just not going to do it. Well, how about we just cut off the funding then? You guys figure out how to live on a smaller budget because this really isn't up to you. This is the state saying we can't do it. You guys are going to need to do this. I mean, the legislature's been saying it uh, all the way back to, like you said, 2016, 2015. The Fisher report, you know, back in the in the aughts was like, hey, this is not good stuff. We should consolidate. I mean, they've been talking about this for 10 years. And every time uh, the discussion comes up, there's always like, oh, we'll put it off on the horizon or we'll always shine you on. And that's been the modus operandi here, about 40 seconds. Well, yeah, it's, I mean, as long as... As long as you're asking, uh, 
the special interests to, to regulate themselves, they're not going to do it. I mean, it's, it, we're, what we're going to see in this legislature is people introduce uh, spending bills that, that re-up uh, increase the university spending, not 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 do that additional twenty billion or twenty million reduction that uh, that the governor and the and the board agreed last year. They're, we're going to have legislators who are pushing to increase it. Let me get caught up here in the chat room. We're uh, ways behind. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion I see back and forth here between Ken and Jerrica and others about graduation rates in the university and how an eight to fifteen percent graduation rate is acceptable because people aren't really going to college to get a degree uh, because a lot of them are community college students, which, again, I don't necessarily disagree with. I don't know what the average uh, graduation rate at a college is, but I would say that it would have to be approaching 50 percent. This is my opinion, 50 percent for me to feel like the college is actually doing uh, some kind of adequate job. I would agree some are just going for certain classes, but uh, it just doesn't seem to, you know, to say that 8% is an adequate graduation rate, especially when we're spending 200% of the uh, national average, just doesn't seem to make any sense to me. Uh, a lo- Go ahead. Well, we're, we're sort of using the university system in Alaska for two purposes. We're using it for a community college, and then we're using it for a four in, four-year institution. And those graduation rates are, are four-year or five-year numbers. Uh, of how many people graduate from the university. There are a lot of people going just for community college. And one solution some have talked about, not the Board of Regents, of course, but one solution some have talked about is going back to a community college system uh, where, where you spend less um, uh, and 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 essentially say, okay, we're going to have a community college system and we're going to have one four-year institution uh, someplace, but we're going to have all these community colleges spread throughout the state. And and you would see the graduation rate likely go up because you wouldn't have people in the system who are actually using it for a community college uh, counting toward that graduation rate. You would see the four-year graduation rate. If you had a four-year institution and then a bunch of community colleges, you would see that four-year uh, institution graduation rate go up. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, 90 seconds out. Everybody else, or a lot of, not everybody else, but a bunch of other folks are also talking about the school system. You and I have talked about that. 54 separate districts, uh, you know, where probably eight or nine of them are accounting for, uh, you know, probably 70% of the students. Uh, We've got some inroads there that we could make as well, right, Brad? About a minute here. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, yes, there are efficiencies all throughout government. There are there are cost savings all throughout government. The key is getting 16, getting a governor who will cut down to those levels and getting 16 in the legislature who will support it. We don't have that right now. Yeah. No, I would agree 100 percent right now. We don't have, uh, you know, the governor may be willing, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak at this point. Because, again, as we pointed out previously, uh, you, you've got a governor who put this big, you know, uh, cut together and you couldn't even get the 16 to agree to cut things like the Arts Council and some of the other <laughs> things. You know, it's always it's always the my special program. You know, you can't cut the Department of Ag. You can't cut the this. You can't cut the that. And, yeah, everybody's going to feel some pain. And, yeah, maybe some of those cuts weren't the most laser focused cuts that they could have been. Maybe they should have been made on other things. But you've all got to start somewhere and, uh, and I think that's the important part. But let's get into number two, which is uh, there's been an opinion piece out from uh, Senator Shelley Hughes, which talks about a couple different things. Uh, it talks, ma- the most of it, the majority of it, it talks about kind of the tug of war between the different factions in the state, you know, uh, uh, more PFD cuts to more taxes to cut the budgets to all this other kind of stuff. The whole point that she's trying to make here is that what she thinks is that we really need is uh, some kind of state auditor who will look at this in an impartial, uh, practical way and go through it. But she also makes a mention of a spending cap, which I think is the direction that you want to go. But give us your thoughts here on this piece uh, from Senator Shelley Hughes and the uh, your reaction to it. Well, I commend Senator Hughes for for coming forward with creative ideas on how to deal with uh, with resolving the the continued disputes we have uh, about spending levels. And and this is a great follow on to the first segment. Her her proposal is to have a state auditor. Uh, it's not clear whether we would elect the auditor or whether we would appoint the auditor, but to have a state auditor who would come in in a impartial, non uh, nonpartisan way. Look at spending levels in the various uh, in the various uh, government agencies uh, and various government programs. Determine what level is 
excuse me, determine what level is um, is is uh, is appropriate under the Constitution, fulfills constitutional mandates, uh, identify inefficiencies, uh, and with the, with the entire goal of reducing or identifying the state spending level. Uh, that's sort of the baseline spending level. And I, I don't have a problem with any of that. I'm not particularly convinced it's realistic. Uh, I mean, that's what legislative finance will tell you that they do. That's what OMB will tell you they do. Um, uh, y y inevitably, politics is going to creep into that. No matter what clean, shining night we find out there to serve as state auditor, Politics is going to is going to creep into it, particularly when it finally comes to the legislature, and and what is one person's inefficiency is another person's job, just like we're just like we were discussing at the university, um, and the person whose job is is being declared inefficient will push back and and uh, and 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 fight about that. So it, it's a it's a it's a laudable goal. Uh, and a laudable, laudable process that, Sen that Senator Hughes has has outlined. I'm not sure how practical it is, but it's laudable. But here's here's my concern. All of this effort, it, when you read the article, all of the effort uh, is to is to identify a spending level uh, that 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 would then serve as a baseline going forward. What she says in the article, and this is a quote: "Once we know we're not spending wastefully." and that we're spending enough to adequately provide state services, we will have the much needed budget baseline, which can be adjusted annually for inflation. That is, that is a, what she's really talking about is a spending cap, the, ba the, 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 the baseline, the spending baseline, a spending cap that would be adjusted annually for inflation. Th there's a big debate uh, in and we're going to go into it again this year as we have a discussion but, uh, about spending cap, the spending caps. There's a big debate about what you base the spending cap on. Some, including Natasha when she's talked about it, and, and now Senator Hughes in this article, some want to base it on prior spending and take prior spending and then adjust that spending uh, for uh, inflation or for inflation plus population or, or all sorts of different factors but adjust that spending going forward to set to set the spending cap. Others, uh, and I'm I'm in I'm in this other side. Others want to base it on revenues uh, and set the spending cap based on revenues. The 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 proposal I've talked about in the past is using a five year uh, running average of of revenue levels and base uh, base spending on that. Here's the problem with basing it like Senator Hughes's proposal basing it on on basing the spending cap on past spending levels revenues don't keep up with spending from 2012 to 2019 unrestricted general fund revenues declined 85 percent if we had set the spending cap level uh based upon spending levels in 2012 which was really before the big run-up started in 2012 right uh the spending cap would have would have would have spiked way away from that from 2019 to 2029, uh, looking at the revenue forecast, revenues are projected to decline another 14%. UGF revenues are projected to decline another 14, 14%. So if you set spending levels at 2019 and, and escalate the spending cap by inflation from there, revenues aren't going to keep up with that. Even when revenues are growing, they aren't growing at, at the rate of inflation. If you look at the, if you look at the um, uh, revenue forecast, from 2020 to 2019, revenues go up, but they only grow, go up at the rate of 1.6% per year, while inflation is projected to be at 2.25. And again, so you set a spending cap at, based upon spending levels plus inflation, it quickly outstrips where your revenues are. You're, you're just you're creating you're just creating another problem. The spending cap is is going up. People say, oh well, we ought to be spending at that level because that's what we decided to do. But revenues aren't keeping up with it, and, and so your fiscal gap is growing, and you're going to have to fill it uh, some way. If you set the spending cap at revenues, then you don't have that problem. Revenues, I mean, your spending cap is always being driven by what you actually have coming in the door uh, that you can spend. So my problem with Senator Hughes is not the, is not the proposal for the state. Order. I, think that's, I think that's fine. I'm not sure it's realistic. It's realistically going to produce anything, but I think that's fine. My problem with with Senator Hughes and Senator von Imhoff and others who 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 make these proposals is a spending cap that's based on prior spending levels. Uh, 
it doesn't it, it, it to me it's sort of a placebo it says we're doing something it makes everybody feel good it makes us think that we're actually getting spending under control but it's not because revenues don't uh, aren't aren't tracking spending and it just sets up another situation where we're going to have fiscal gaps going into the future Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, is our guest. This has been part of the problem, uh, Brad, that you, you know I have talked about for a long time. You just you can't say, well, we're going to control our future spending based on what we're spending now. I mean, no household, no company would ever, uh, you know, would ever do that in the long run simply because it's just not sustain. I mean, if I if I could borrow money and spend all this other kind of stuff, and I'm going to base all future spending on that, and when you break it down to that perspective, it makes total sense. But this is the way that many politicians want to look at this. They say that, oh, no, we, we've got to be able to base this on what we've spent so far. We've got to learn to live within our means. And unfortunately, we've had the ability, both at the state level and at the national level, to live well beyond our means. Uh, but that that's going to come to a screeching halt in both arenas here in the near future. Yeah, exactly. And our means live within our means. Our means are revenues. Our means aren't spending. Our means are revenues. So living within our means means living within revenues. If, 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 even if Senator Hughes, um, uh, I, I've got a chart that I put on the Facebook page that sort of makes this point. Even if Senator Hughes, um, was and and the and the auditor the state auditor was able to reduce spending levels from the 4.3 that we have for this year let's say all the way down to the 3.7 or the 3.8 that the spring revenue forecast a, a, a drop of another 500 million dollars the, the the spring revenue forecast said we were going to have well now the fall revenue <laughs> forecast is below is below the spring revenue forecast and if you started at that 3.8 and escalated by inflation from that point forward, you'd still have a spending gap because the revenue growth that the fall revenue forecast is telling us we're going to have isn't keeping up with inflation. It's only 1.6 over the span of, of the nine years. And in some years, it's below the prior year. Um, it, it sort of tails up at the end, but for the next few years, revenues actually go down uh, uh, for about four years before, before they start ticking back up. So a spending cap defined by spending prior spending plus inflation it, it, it's just not going to work uh, uh, in an environment where revenues uh, uh, don't grow with inflation where revenues uh, go up and, and go down and and we all know oil prices go up and they go down so essentially saying we're going to have a spending cap that's, that's going to be tied to spending while while the revenue side is going up and down based upon oil prices just does is, is not a recipe for success. It's a recipe. If you look at the oil price forecast, it's a recipe for uh, eat, growing the fiscal gap again, uh, and 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 the spending cap just not in, not achieving uh, uh, anything. We've talked about the potential for a spending cap in the Constitution. Uh, the cap that has been proposed by the governor suffers from the same problem. It's based uh, specifically on spending in the language. We've talked about that. Uh, what do you think the chances are of any kind of spending cap getting placed in this next legislative cycle as contentious as it could be? Oh, Michael, I'm, I am, I'm pessimistic about this. What, what I think we're going to see is, is things like Senator Von Imhoff and Senator Hughes' proposal well, I, I think we're going to see proposals for for uh, uh, spending-based spending caps as a as a placebo to tell people they're doing something when they're when they're not really doing it. You'll know they're serious if they go to a revenue-based spending cap. Well, again, same kind of thing, the same kind of placebo. If it's a statutory cap, it's all you know, smoke and mirrors at this point. We've got to get serious about. Well, this has been the thing that I have had the hardest. I've had the most heartburn with is this idea of a spending cap based on revenue because there is no company, no, and as I said, no company or no private individual, no household is going to base all of their future uh, spending and their plans, their spending plans based on what they've been spending now and moving up from that ratcheting up from the current spending i mean you know hey i'm living on i'm living on credit i'm 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 maxed out on my cards 
Uh, you know, I'm spending 120% of my income every year, but I'm going to base my future, you know, spending habits on that projection versus what is my actual revenue. I mean, it's madness. It's insanity. But that is the direction that these folks, uh, you know, want to take us. Anybody that's that's pushing this idea of a, uh, of a, of a spending cap based on revenue. Yeah, the criticism I hear of a revenue-based spending cap is that oh well you know what what all you're saying is when we have periods of high of high revenue we'll spend you're 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 permitting us to spend it all and that that's not that's not accurate I mean y- yes if you had a if you had a spending cap that said whatever your revenue is this year you can spend it all that would be a problem but the but the spending cap that that I've talked about and others have talked about that's based on revenue is based on a five year rolling average. So as oil prices go up and oil prices go down, the five-year rolling average tends to smooth that uh, over time and, and, and keeps, in years of high revenues, uh, keeps a constraint on uh, and, and, and says you can't spend all that revenue the five-year. We we're, we're factoring in years of low uh, revenues, and so you have to keep your spending within that constraint. And then when revenues go down, uh, because you've saved – during the prior years, during the high revenue years, you couldn't spend it all because you had the spending cap in place and you had to put that in the CBR during periods of low revenue. Uh, then you have that reserve that you've built up during the high revenue periods to, to supplement uh, and keep spending a, a, at a relatively even level. And using five years, I've, I've charted five years, 10 years, 15 years, two years, seven years, uh, using a five-year average tends to keep it, it tends to keep it within a fairly uh, narrow band <coughs> excuse me and keep spending fairly keep spend the spending cap fairly even over that period um, and so and so I understand there are criticisms of, of a revenue based cap but there are ways to deal with a revenue based cap uh, that, that deal with those criticisms there's no way frankly in my mind to deal with a spending based uh, spending cap. Uh, that that deals with the criticisms because e- even if you average it over the last five years of spending, if your revenues don't keep up with that, uh, which we haven't over the last uh, decade and are and are projected not to over the next decade, if your if your if your revenue levels don't keep up with the rate of inflation, uh, uh, you're 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 just not going to you're not going to be able to to match that spending cap, and so the spending cap either becomes irrelevant or people say, oh, we set the spending cap, so we have to spend up to the spending cap. Um, uh, you, you then you're, you're just creating fiscal gaps that you have to deal with in the out years. Yeah, absolutely. But right now we're getting into number three of the weekly top three with Brad Keithley. Number three is, uh, is the Permanent Fund Corporation and their current warning, something that Brad and I have been talking about for, I think, the last five years. What happens when we draw too hard and we don't control our spending and we draw too hard on the piggy bank and then the not even just the, the, the savings account, but now the only available pot of money, easily available, which is the earnings reserve. What happens there? Bradley, uh, what is the uh, PF Corp uh, warning mean to us? Well, the Permanent Fund Corporation has warned at its meeting last week, obviously, that if you draw too hard on the earnings reserve, um, uh, in any given in, in for over, over any given period, you run the risk that the earnings reserve is going to deplete, uh, and not only will you not have uh, money to pay the PFD, which comes from the earnings reserve, but you won't have money available from the uh, from the permanent fund through the earnings reserve to help supplement uh, the cost of government, to help supplement revenues and the cost of government, and we're relying over the past decade we've come to rely over the past few years we've come to rely heavily uh, on on draws from the earnings reserve to uh, to help uh, uh, meet the cost of government uh, and we're certainly relying on it heavily if you look at the fall revenue pro- forecast we're certainly relying on draws from the earnings reserve uh, going forward uh, to meet the cost of government uh, as well as pay uh, the PFD the Permanent Fund Corporation's warning really is in two parts. One is overdraws above the the, the rate set for uh, the percent of market value, the rate set uh, by the legislature a couple of years ago for the draw on percent of market value. Overdraws, draws above that level, uh, are going to are going to run you into trouble fast. Uh, that that the the draw rate uh, that you've set is based upon uh, their expectation. 
of what the average earnings level is going to be uh, over time. Um, and that if you're drawing in excess of that, if you're using the earnings reserve as a piggy bank, the earnings reserve is limited uh, in, in the dollars it has, and you can exhaust that earnings reserve. And if you don't have the earnings reserve, then you don't have the PF, you don't have money for the PFD, and you don't have money to uh, to help supplement revenues uh, toward the costs of government. That that's one point. Overdrawing the POMV rate um, uh, using the earnings reserve as a piggy bank uh, can run you into trouble fast. And that's certainly true. There's a second warning in there that I think is is also uh, significant, important, and 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 perhaps to me even more important. And that is the earning the the, the permanent fund is is telling us that um, it, even at the POMV rate set by the legislature, even at the five point two five percent that steps down to five percent in one more year. Uh, even at that draw rate, you run the risk of depleting, uh, depleting the earnings reserve, and that's because what what they're suggesting is uh, the stock market, the the market in which uh, the permanent fund is invested, could have will have down periods um, as well, uh, just like oil prices go down. That the stock market and other other uh, assets in which they are invested could have down down periods as well, and earn less. Than the five percent projected uh, in the uh, in the five percent real rate of return projected in the statute, um, and if it has if you have enough years of a down market where it's earning less than five percent, or in fact potentially losing uh, money, if you continue if you nevertheless continue through those years to draw at five percent, uh, that that you have a risk of depleting. Uh, the mark, uh, you, you have a risk of depleting the earnings reserve uh, as well in that uh, scenario. And in the in the analysis that the Permanent Fund Corporation released last week, uh, they showed that there was a 15% a, a, a chance of running out of money uh, over the next decade, even, even if you limited draws uh, to the 5% uh, set by the statute. That's not a particularly high percentage. Um, uh, I think a 15% uh, com compared to 100, 15% <laughs> is a relatively low level of risk. But the permanent fund was sort of was sort of sort of covering its back by saying, "Hey, you know, we're telling you that there's a risk that we run out of money, um, that, that the earnings reserve earnings reserve runs out of money even at uh, uh, even at the five percent draw rate. So that if those situ if that circumstance comes to fruition." Uh, the the permanent fund corporation can say, hey, we told you back there, in, you know, 2019 that that there was a risk of that. Um, what I one of the things, and, and that's a risk we ought to, we ought to realize. That's a risk we ought to take into account, uh, and it's a risk we ought to we ought to we ought to keep in keep in mind. One of the one of the problems I've had I had with SB 26 uh, and the POMV draw rate um, is that is that it's somewhat an artificial rate. It's it's a projection. The 5% is a projection of what the permanent fund corporation thinks uh, the permanent fund, the assets, the, the range of assets that they have are going to return, have a real rate of return uh, over over a prolonged period. Uh, and that 5%, what, what the permanent fund corporation is saying, that 5% may or may not come true. Um, historically, uh, the permanent fund corporation has earned a higher rate of return than 5% on its assets. Um, and and so if you were looking at it on a historical basis, actually the contributions from the permanent fund corporation from the earnings reserve could and should be greater uh, than five percent based upon its historical returns. Uh, but the five percent was set uh, on a forward-looking basis. I think I think there ought to be some discussion, just like I said at the time uh, that SB 26 was being considered by the legislature. I think there ought to be some discussion of setting. The draw rate, uh, based upon again the historical average uh, of of what the earnings fund uh, of what the the permanent fund has has earned, so that if you look back over the last ten years and it's earned five point three percent, the draw uh, uh, on that rolling average would be five point three percent this year. If the rolling average next year was five point four. The draw would be 5.4. If the rolling average the next year was was 5.1, the draw would be 5.1. The benefit of that is you're not guessing at the future. You're you're basing it on on history, 
and you've already earned those monies. I mean, you had a real you've you've had a real rate of return uh, of five point two percent or whatever the ten year rolling average is. You've had a real rate of return at that level, so the money's in the permanent fund, um, uh, and and so it's 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 already in presumably in the earnings reserve, and so you're just you're drawing down money that you've already earned as opposed to drawing money uh, that's based upon a projection of what you think you're going to continue to earn into the future. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, is our guest. We're talking about, <clears throat> excuse me, we're talking about the earnings reserve account and uh, and what happens if, it's, uh, if it gets overdrawn. Uh, Brad, uh, the problem here, of course, is, is that this is the most easily accessible source of money, uh, for the legislature, uh, there is, you know, there's very little left in the uh, constitutional budget reserve. There's, there's nothing left essentially uh, in the st- statutory budget reserve. So all other easy forms of money are there, and even in, in a, and as far as rating the permanent fund, the portions of that come out of the earnings reserve. And so does this force them, as we asked earlier uh, in regards to, to some other things, does this force anybody to, you know, come to the realization that we are spending more than we take in and it is not a sustainable way to to run government or budget? Boy, I hope so. I mean, I, I, if, if the combination of the, uh, of the fall revenue forecast – and the and the permanent fund corporations warning last week. If the combination of those do, two don't shock the legislature into reality, uh, I'm not sure what what is uh, up to the point that we actually go bankrupt. Up to the point where you know we actually run the CBR dry, we actually run the earnings reserve dry. Uh, oil prices haven't recovered, and we're facing the year when we actually don't have the revenues. If 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 the for if the warnings we've gotten. In the past couple of weeks, if these warnings don't shock the, the government into reality, we're not going to have reality until we absolutely run everything dry uh, and, and somebody gets to you know, cl- turn out the lights uh, as, they're, as they're leaving the building. So it's, I, I hope it does. Um, it should. I mean, the fall revenue forecast, my eyes grew big as, as I look at these out-year numbers. It, we do, there is no cavalry coming over the hill. We're done. There's no cavalry coming over the hill to save us. Um, and if that doesn't shock people into into reality, um, I, I don't know what is. Do you I can well, I can already see this. Now David Teal is is uh, on the outs now. He's he's retiring. So I mean I could see this being spun by somebody, obviously not Teal or somebody else, but I mean that's historically what's happened is that there's always been that last minute opportunity to uh, oh, don't worry, we'll be saved by, you know, in year 2 or year 3, we'll be saved because things will go on so we can just continue as normal. These are really shocking numbers and I, I don't know if I can overstate that at this point. Uh, and basing, you know, the whole conversation really can round back up to that revenue forecast. As you said, there is no cavalry. There is no Hail Mary pass that's going to fix this in in the long run. No, no. I mean, revenue numbers, we're, we're looking at revenue numbers uh, that go down for the next three years. <laughs> it's You think we're in a bad shape now. They go down for the next three years. They start coming back up after that, but they go down from where we are now. Look at the revenue forecast. Look, look at, look at the numbers we've got on the on the on the on the Facebook page. They go down. We are facing. We we have hit the wall. We've come to the end. We we put band aids on as long as we could. There is no band aid big enough anymore. We've run out of band aids. Run through them all. There is no band aid left uh, uh, that that can that can run this over. And if we try to use the earnings reserve, what the permanent fund is telling us, if you try to use the earnings reserve as sort of the final piggy bank, that's going to run out too, and then you're dead. Right. Uh, you're absolutely dead. So well, and all you do this is, is it. And all you do is you try to look and you scramble in the economy to find other ways to generate that revenue. All you do is damage the private economy in the long run in an effort to try and bolster and prop up that public economy. That is a long-term problem that is even worse than what we're dealing with right now, uh, especially, well, sh- especially well, if well, we wait. Well, well, sure, it, sure it is. Sure, it's a long-term problem. But 
you got to stop. I mean, you, you, you don't solve that problem. You've got to fill this gap somehow. You don't stop that problem unless you stop spending. And we can't get 16 in the legislature to back up the governor on stopping spending. Yeah. Yep. Well, we're going to wait and see. I, I'm not I'm not confident that this session is going to be any more successful than last session. I think we I, quite honestly, at this point, I think we need to feel some more pain and then we're going to have to go through an election cycle. And hopefully the people who are frustrated as we are with this whole process will maybe change out some of the players moving into the uh, into the next session, the following session. Uh, and maybe we can get some real change uh, in that regard there. Uh, Brad, final thoughts here. We're, we're out of time. Michael, it's time for it's time for people to wake up. Read the fall revenue uh, uh, forecast. At least look at the charts that we that we've posted on Alaska for sustainable budgets. Um, you, you need to deal with this and then you need to tell your legislators we've hit the wall. You need to be responsible enough of, you know, funding the Arts Council enough of of, of three universities. It's time to make serious, deep changes uh, in this state. You, you, there, there's no other conclusion you can come to once you read the fall revenue forecast. Uh, maybe Michael Sheldon has the quote of the day today as we leave. He says the cavalry is coming in the 2020 election. We can only keep our fingers crossed at this point, Brad, that's for sure. Uh, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Brad, thank you so much for coming on board and joining us today. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.